Welcome to the channel guys, Danny Stone here and with the Cicero Patra Imperator Rome in full swing, offering the game and more importantly us, the players, a much needed update and improvement on the base version of the game, which bear in mind did have its flaws, I thought it was about time a tutorial video was put out there explaining all of the new features in the Cicero patch for newcomers to the game and people who bought the game day one but felt disappointed and let down now who feel that maybe with the Cicero patch is the right time to jump back in. In this video I will go over all the new features and mechanics and try to explain what they do in the simplest of terms possible and how to get the best out of the game. Anyway, let's jump right in. First of all, one of the most notable changes in Cicero is the removal of the Monarch Points, or known as Mana to the Paradox community. Instead, the developers have come up with two distinct resource pools, Political Influence and Military Experience, both located up here at the very top of the resource bar. The former represents the ruler's political clout, basically how much political power he wields within a realm, and this enables him to exert various political and diplomatic actions such as fabricate claims, maybe even change governor policies, improve relations with other countries, or improve provinces. For example, if I were to go to a neighbouring country, maybe go to Byblos down here, now this is my Epirus playthrough uh, where I'm doing quite well to be honest, if you do want to see it the link will be in the description below and it should have a pop up right now. So if I were to right click on Byblos here and you will see that if we go down to the convert actions tab underneath there is a fabricate claim option with 20 political influence next to it. If I were to click this button and enact the fabricate claim process, I would then lose 20 political influence up here in the political influence storage and be down to 18 instead of 38. Let's give it a try now. Fabricate claim, Bithynia Inferior, and there you go. I have used my political influence in order to start the process of fabricating a claim. Political influence is generated each month depending on the loyalty of the people in your government. To find this out, all you need to do is go over to the Government tab, open it up, click on Show Officers, and here you have all the major players in your realm with all their associated spots in Government. For example, if I was to move my cursor over the Loyalty section of the Epiproxenos here, it would say that each month this character generates 0.18 political influence based on the fact that he has 74 Loyalty. If I was to go over underneath to this Trophius Herocon Amnitid here, you would see that his political influence he generates is a little bit higher due to the fact that he is more loyal to me than the previous guy. In effect, the first dude who has 74 loyalty generates 0.18 political influence, and the Trophius who is more loyal to me with 91 loyalty generates slightly more. If you want to check this out, all you need to do is move your mouse cursor over the political influence icon and here you can see a detailed description of who provides how much political influence um, and if you want to just double check, we can see. The Epiproxenos generates 0.18 and the Trophius 0.22 per month. These numbers add up when we scroll the mouse cursor over the loyalty section in the office tab. The latter, Military Experience, represents the military knowledge of your realm and is used to purchase military traditions that can give powerful buffs to your troops. To find these military traditions, all you need to do is cycle to the Military tab, open it up, and you will see three columns which detail the traditions for a particular nation. These traditions change depending on the culture group you play. As you see here with Epirus, we have the Greek traditions which give their unique set of buffs and bonuses. Military experience, just like political influence, is generated monthly. It increases at a base rate of 0.30 per month and can be increased further depending on a variety of factors. In order to find this out, all you need to do is hover your mouse cursor over the military experience in the resource tab, and here you'll see a detailed breakdown of how much military experience you gain and what affects it. Here in my Epirus playthrough, you can see that I gain 0.74 military experience every month, due to a base experience gain of 0.30. Now that base of 0.30, it doesn't change no matter who you play. No matter your religion, your culture, or your placement, you will always gain that base 0.30 military experience per month. On top of that, you can possibly gain more military experience depending on your average cohort experience. So depending on the amount of experience that all of your armies have, the average experience of them all gets added to your military experience. To find that out, 
Just click on any army and you can see that an army has two green bars. The one furthest to the left here as you can see is the experience bar and that details the amount of experience a cohort has. The higher that, the higher that value, the less damage they take in battle. And if I were to take the experience of all of my armies, so of each little cohort in all of these armies, and get the average of that experience, then they add it onto the average cohort experience for your military experience gain per month. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> you can also gain a little bit more military experience if your war exhaustion is low, as you can see, plus 0.33% due to the fact that I have no war exhaustion. And you can also gain a little bit more experience, uh, military experience, sorry, if you change a couple of laws in your government tab. As you can see, I have the nobility admission laws, which should be down here somewhere, if I can find it. <laughs> nobility admission law, here it is, military reforms, which gives me monthly military experience plus 5%, which is why you can see that 5% modifier up in the military experience. You might also ask me, is there another way you can gain military experience apart from fighting battles? Well, there is. What you can do, you can click on a particular army, assign a governor or a general to that army, and have them drill them. When you drill an army, you must have a general or a governor. You cannot do it without a commander. When you do that, you increase your monthly experience gain for each cohort by 2.5%. So each month, each cohort in this army will gain 2.5% experience, which will add to this experience bar, and therefore increasing the average military experience of your cohorts, therefore giving me more military experience. However, this does come at a slight cost. Your army maintenance goes up by 33%, and you also have a loyalty chance gain plus one towards the commanding officer. What does that mean? That means that every month, these troops get a certain chance to become loyal to this army general instead of me, the leader. You can see which troops are loyal to the general and not me by looking at the little loyal hand next to the banners of each cohort. As you can see, RGI's third Shilotis archers are loyal to Hephaestan Tariskid, the general, and not to me, the Basilus Hyperides. It's also worth mentioning that removing mana changed the currency for purchasing inventions. It now costs gold, which scales depending on the revenue. As you can see here, it now costs a certain amount of set gold to actually buy an invention, otherwise than before it was spend a certain amount of political, uh, political power or monarch points to buy said invention. For example, military artisans, basic training or scorched earth, which are of the military inventions, used to cost military monarch points. Now they only cost gold, and this scales depending on how much gold you make per month. The second major change of the Cicero patch is the restructuring of the administrative units. Pre-Cicero, there was only one singular administrative unit, that being the city. Every territory or tile in the game was a city. With Cicero, this changed everything. There are now three distinct administrative types, the settlement, the city, and finally, the metropolis. To explain this, I'm going to go through each and every one of these individually to try and explain these to the best of my ability. First of all, let's start with the smallest administrative unit in the game, that being the settlement. To illustrate this, I have clicked on my, sitters, on my settlement sorry, in Kosope to show you what a settlement is like. As you can see, the settlement is the smallest cellular unit in the game. As you can see, they have a limited pop capacity, which is quite small, and they also have only one building slot available. In addition to this, they also have a very limited pool of buildings to choose from, only seven. However, settlements can be upgraded into cities for a cost of gold and political influence. In order to do so, all you need to do is go down to the territory status in the build section and click found a city. This will cost you 200 gold and 50 political influence, but the settlement will then be upgraded to a city, which brings me to the next administrative unit, that being the city. To illustrate the city, I have clicked on the city in my empire here, the city of Umbrachia, just to show you what these are all about. As you can see, cities have a higher pop capacity than their previous counterparts, the settlements. They also have more access to building slots, and it's worth noting that for every 10 pops, you gain an extra building slot. You can also build more diverse buildings than they are in settlements, which means you can really choose to specialise what you want in your cities. Where to build cities, however, is entirely up to you but I would recommend a few things. 
Limit your cities to a maximum of two per province, as cities concentrate people and you definitely need to feed them. Try to build them on coastal areas, on near ports and on farmland, because this increases pop capacity and migration attraction. To illustrate this, I will now show you my city in Apollonia and why I've chose to build it on here. As you can see, if I click on the city, and you can see under the city building section, there is a little image of some terrain. You can see here it's farmland, and this is quite useful for where you want to build your cities. Farmlands give you a pop capacity bonus of plus 50%, ideal for concentrating people in one area. It also gets rid of, also reduces the amount of slaves needed for surplus in order to make more goods. If you want to see where to build these cities on farmlands and other types of terrain, I recommend clicking on the simple terrain map mode, which would then highlight all the different terrain of each, to each different indistinct tile. As you can see here, the Apollonia is on farmland, which is why I chose to build the city here, and as you can see, it's a big, nice and juicy city. I mentioned before as well that building them on ports is quite useful. Ports give you extra migration attraction. And you can see this by going down under the domestic tab, down right to the bottom here, you have the migration attraction. And you can see, because the city is built on a coastal port, it gives plus two attraction. This means that this city is highly attractive and is pulling populations from the, from the surrounding territories into this city. These pops that wish to come there will migrate over time. And finally, don't build cities on settlements which produce food unless you really have to. Building a city on a settlement that produces food changes that territory's production to another resource that is not food. Remember, you need food to feed your pops. For example, if I was to look for a territory which produces food, which I'm going to go into the trade goods map mode here, and I'll go down in a province here, for example, here at the settlement that produces fish. If I was to go into the build tab and then go down to the territory status and click on build a city, you'll see that one of five options will happen. 11% chance that Lissos will now produce papyrus, 33% chance that it will produce cloth, and 22% chance it will produce either earthenware or dyes, and 11% chance it will produce glass. When this territory has been upgraded to a city, it will remove the fish that has been produced here and change it with one of these five goods. Considering that you need to feed your pops, and all since a lot of pops are concentrated in cities, if you remove the fish that is produced from this territory, you are going to produce less food, and therefore run the risk of not having enough, enough food to feed your pops. All this talk about food brings me to another mechanic implemented by the Paradox team in the game, and that is the food mechanic. Every territory in the game produces a certain amount of food. If I click on any one of these territories, you will all see the same icon, a bit of bread with a jug indicating the monthly food income. This monthly food income is either positive if you make surplus food or negative if you consume more food than you produce. For example, here in Albanopolis, we make 1.90 food per month, so we are making more food than we consume in that territory. However, if I was to click on one of my major cities, for example, Apollonia, you will see here that we consume more food than we produce, so we lose 20.5 food per month. At the end of every month, the difference between your production of food and consumption of food in a province is either added or subtracted from the province food bar. If the number is positive, it gets added to the province food because we make more food than we consume. If the number is negative, that means we consume more we produce in the province and therefore this bar will slowly deplete, indicating that the province is starving. The amount of food you can store is located in the province food capacity just to the left of the province food. Here you can see at the top the current amount of food stored and the bottom the maximum amount of food stored. Here in the province of Bolivia Gracia you can see we have stored the maximum amount of food possible. This storage capacity can be increased by buildings and a well stocked province gives you certain bonuses. The fact that this province is stocked up to the maximum of food, it gives us plus 0.10 pop growth and plus 5% fort defence. This can be seen just by moving your cursor over the province food bar. This is why it is highly important to keep your territories producing food producing food, therefore not really building cities on them. If in Illyria Gratia I would take out the territories that produce food and put cities on them, 
then we would produce less food and therefore consume more than we produce, resulting in a deficit of food, which is definitely not good for your pops. It is also worth noting that standing armies in provinces can consume food. Therefore, you need to be careful where you'll place your heavily stacked armies. For example, this army here, the first shock army stationed in the province of Aeolia here, consumes a lot of food. This can be seen by the apple icon next to the unit, which means it's suffering attrition and consuming food. You can also see this if you go to the province food bar of that province. So just click on any territory in this province, move over to the food bar, and here you can see that the food consumption changes by minus 12, 20 each month due to unit attrition that gives us minus 16 in that province. And of course, we don't produce enough food to counteract that minus 16. Hence, the loss of minus 12.2 food per month. This is why when you move armies through your different provinces and station them in certain areas, it is highly advisable to actually have a province well stocked in food or that can easily maintain that army for a long period of time. Anyway, now we've got the food out the way, let's move on to the biggest cellular administrative unit in the game, that of the metropolis. Any city can be upgraded to a metropolis for the cost of 400 gold and 100 political influence. However, there is one standing factor that you need to take into account. There needs to be at least 80 pops residing in that city. To do this, the simple same procedure as doing a settlement into a city. You just click on any city that has over 80 pops, go down to the build section and click on found a metropolis. As you can see, at the cost of 400 gold and 100 political influence, you will make the city a metropolis. I did forget to mention that building a city or metropolis takes time. It isn't an instant click. It takes two years for it to actually be built. And during them two years, the population production will reduce by 100%. Increasing the city to a metropolis gives the following benefits. It increases the pop capacity of the city, and it also increases their migration attraction by plus two. Remember, you can see this by going down to the Migration Attraction section in the domestic line of the building interface. Here, you will see that with Metropolis gets a bonus of plus two to Migration Attraction, and as we know, Migration Attraction pulls more people from other territories around you, including not your territories. Basically, if I had a city or Metropolis with a high Migration Attraction on the border with a rival, for instance, then pops out of my rival's territory might migrate towards my own city. Now with all this speaking about cities and metropolises, you may be asking, well, what is the best combination of buildings to get the most out of my cities and metropolises? Well, I tend to find that tech is highly important in the game and the advantages of being ahead of your rival tech-wise is absolutely critical. This is why I like to fill up my cities with libraries and academies. Basically, libraries increase the amount of citizens in your cities and the academy increases the amount of research points and pop promotion speed. Basically, the more citizens you have, then the better it is to build the academies because the more citizens you have, the more research points they make and of course the academies get an increase into the research points. Just to show you how effective this is, I'm going to show you a couple of my cities. Here in Apollonia, you can see I have 60 citizens. That is quite a lot. These all generate 31.31 research points only from this city. This is increased by the fact that I have academies coupled with libraries because the libraries make sure that my pops promote to citizens and then the more citizens I have, the bigger the buff that the academies will give in terms of my research points. If I was to go over into my capital, for example, you'll see the exact same things. I have a high number of libraries and some academies just to increase the amount of citizens. This all plays for your tech. If I show you my tech screen now, you see I make a whopping 520 research points and have a quite high research efficiency rate of 130%, considering that I'm quite a big empire. All this nonsense of promoting pops, citizen ratios and migration attraction of cities allows me to highlight another major change in Cicero, that of dynamic pops. No longer can you convert, assimilate or move a pop at the click of a button. All these mechanics now happen organically over time and the speed at which this happens depends on a variety of factors. 
To help you guys understand this, I'm going to talk about the vertical movement of pops and the horizontal movement of pops. What I call horizontal movement of pops is the assimilation, religious conversion and migration of pops. What do I mean by vertical pop movement? Well, that means promotion of the different pops. I mean slaves being able to organically promote to freemen, and then freemen being able to organically promote to citizens. But this also goes down the other way, by the ways of demotion, like citizens being able to demote to freemen, freemen demoting to slaves, and even tribesmen demoting to slaves. In order to see the vertical and horizontal movement of pops, all we need to do is click on the View Pops button on the Territory tab, open it up, and here it will give you a detailed description of all the pops and what movements are actually currently happening. First of all, we can see the culture and religion section, which shows you if a pop is being assimilated into the culture of the state. For example, here I have one Hellenic Cretan freeman, which is currently in the process of assimilating into an Epirate freeman. This progress is increased by 7.10% per month. So each month, 7.10% will be added to this little green bar here until it reaches 100%. And when that happens, that Hellenic Cretan Freeman will become a Hellenic Epirate Freeman. The same principle is applied for conversion. If you have some pops that are not the state religion, then they will organically be promoted over time under here in the conversion section. As you can see here, that all my pops in Apollonia are Hellenic, which is my state religion, therefore no conversion is happening. Another section of the horizontal pop movement is the migration section. Here we can see which pops are migrating and where from, and at the speed at which they're migrating. The principle is the same. You have a certain percentage per month, which adds to this progress bar. Once that bar reaches 100%, then that pop would have migrated to this city. In order to see this, all you need to do is click on the little icon here or move your mouse cursor over it and you will see where the pop is migrating from. Here we can see that the Hellenic Epirate citizen, because we can see he's got a citizen logo, is migrating from... Um, where's he migrating from? Migrating from here, <laughs> sorry. And Shialos, right over on the other side of our empire. So this pop migration is not limited to just neighbouring territories. They can happen right across the empire. Their migration, the speed at which it happens, and the amount of people migrate to a certain territory depends on the migration attraction of that particular territory. If you remember, Apollonia is a city, therefore the migration attraction is significantly high. It's increased even more so down to the fact that it's a metropolis, which gives it a plus two to migration attraction, and of course the coastal port, which gives it another plus two, hence going back to the ideal locations to found your cities. The speed at which these pops assimilate, convert and migrate can be increased based on a number of factors. They can be increased by the use of buildings. For example, if I wanted to speed up the assimilation of pops to my culture, we could possibly build some theatres. Here you see, I have built a theatre here and it increases pop assimilation speed by one, further increasing the speed at which my pops will change their culture. The principle is also applied for the religion build temples to increase further the pop conversion speed, making sure that pops convert to your religion faster. You can also see the vertical movement of pops in the view pop tab on each territory. Here it comes in the form of classes, and we can see which pops get promoted if there are any, or which pops are getting demoted. For example, slaves can be promoted to freemen, freemen then promoted to citizens, and vice versa, citizens can be demoted into freemen or slaves. However, you should note that tribesmen cannot be promoted. They only get demoted into slaves. It's also worth noting that the vertical movement of pops only works really efficiently in the cities. In territories, all pops tend to actually demote into slaves. This is why cities are highly important because it gives you a possibility to actually promote pops into citizens or freemen. Here, if I were to click on Demalion, you will see I have only slaves in there. And if I went on the View Pop screen, you will see there is no promotion and no demotion. This is because sl only slaves can really reside in the settlements. In cities, the promotion and demotion of pops is based on ideal fractions for pops. 
This ideal fraction for pops is seen just under the promotion and demotion section of the classes tab and you can see there's a little rectangle here with all little, little bit of numbers in here and different types of pops. At the top here you can see the current fraction of the pops in the city and underneath it you see the ideal fraction of pops for the city. This basically means that your city will organically promote or demote pops in order to reach the optimal ratio for each desired citizen. So for example, this city here who has reached the ideal rate of 50% of citizen ratio has promoted pops to get to that exact amount. However, if the optimal citizen ratio was a little bit higher at 60%, then the city would keep on promoting pops from the other categories into citizens to get to that desired 60%. This same principle is applied to the other category of pops. For example, here in Apollonia, the optimal Freeman ratio is 30%, and my actual Freeman ratio is 30%. Hence, there's no more promotion of pops because I have got the desired ratio of citizens and Freemans. And considering in cities, I can only promote pops to either freemen or citizens, and since I've, got the, since I've got the optimal ratio here, there's no more promotion going on. If I were to click on a city that has a lower citizen ratio than the optimal ratio, then pops would keep getting promoted. To show you this, I will click on my capital city of Passeron here, and here you can see that the icons have a little plus next to them, or the, rather than the minus. This is because the actual citizen ratio, so the number of citizens I have in the city, equal to 44% of the total pops. The optimal ratio in this city is at 48%. That means that in this city, the pops will promote from the other classes until we get the optimal ratio of 48% citizens. The same is applied to the Freeman. The actual Freeman ratio of the city of Passeron is 25%, while the optimal ratio is 33%, so POTS will organically promote into Freeman. As you can see, this is happening here. I have a Th Hellenic Thracian slave, which is on his way to becoming promoted to a Freeman. This will remove a slave POP and add it as a Freeman POP. You can see in the slave section here, that the actual proportion of slaves in the city is 29%. So 29% of the pops in this city are slaves. To see this, we can just see, look, 47 slaves. And out of the total of 157 pops, 47% of them, I think it's 47%, let me check. No, sorry, 29% of them are slaves. So 29% of the 158 pops are slaves. Here, the optimal slave ratio is 18% we have 11% more than the optimal ratio, which means these slaves will slowly get promoted into either freemen or citizens, therefore increasing, the opt increasing our actual freemen and citizen ratio while decreasing the actual slave ratio. The actual ratio of pops can be managed by buildings. For example, you can build libraries to increase the optimal citizen ratio in your cities. You could also build forums to increase the optimal Freeman ratio in cities. To show you this, I'll just go on the build section and go over to the library and you can see that the local citizen ideal fraction increases by 30%. This means that the optimal ratio of the city concerning citizens will increase when we build the library, therefore giving more room for pop promotion to become citizens. The same principle applies to the forum. It increases the local sit local freeman fra uh, fraction, sorry. Therefore, increasing the optimal ratio of citizen of freeman, sorry, in a city. Therefore, forcing the city to organically promote people into freeman to get that optimal ratio. I hope that was understandable. I tried to do it as simple as I possibly could, but it is a really complicated mechanic. This organic promotion of pops is really pretty cool because it means you can actually plan for what you need. Let's say you need more tech to catch up on arrival, then you can build libraries to increase the amount of citizens in your swell. The increase the amount of citizens that is optimal for your city, therefore pushing the other, other categories of populations to promote into citizens, therefore increasing your tech ratio. The same applies for the manpower. If you need more manpower, you know that freemen give you a fair bit of manpower. 
If you feel that you're low on the manpower side and you want to replenish more per month and have extra manpower, then increase your ideal Freeman ratio, which means then your cities will start promoting or demoting pops to actually fill up the Freemans to their optimal amount. This way not only feels more organic, but increases the satisfaction you get when you actually increase your tech rate or manpower based on a long-term policy and strategy that you have implemented, and you can see this plan organically come to fruition. The vertical movement of pops and horizontal movement of pops can be aided not only with buildings like previously stated, but it can also be helped with governor policies. Governor policies can increase the rate at which pops assimilate, change religion and migrate, but also the rate at which pop promote. For example, if I was to click on any territory in a given province, it would open up the province tab and up here to the left you have your governor policies. To change it, it costs a certain amount of political influence, which depends varies on certain factors, but the result is the same. For example, if I wanted to speed up cultural assimilation in my cities or territories and whatnot, then click on the cultural assimilation per governor policy, which increases the assimilation speed by three, therefore speeding up the actual assimilation of pops. The same is applied for religious conversion. You can just put religious conversion governor policy, which increases the rate at which pops convert. Social mobility is a good for the vertical movement of pops, which increases pop promotion speed, allowing you to get to that ideal pop fraction ratio that you need. These governor policies can be extremely powerful if you couple them with buildings in cities. Because when you get the buildings in cities and couple it with governor policy, then the speed is increased further. If I was to go for cultural assimilation, for example, it would increase the pop assimilation speed of every tile in this province, which is actually really cool. And if you build, let's say, a temple in the city, which also gets, um, not a temple, sorry, a theater in the city, which also gets up the pop assimilation speed, then combining the both, combining the governor policy and the building in the city, it increases it significantly. Governor policies have one big advantage compared to buildings. Governor policies are province-wide, while buildings only apply in the locality in which they're built. That means that if I was to build a temple for religious assimilation in a city, then the bonus of that temple would only be applied in that city, whereas the religious conversion governor policy would make that bonus applied province-wide. Well, that's it, people, for the major changes that Cicero has brought us. I hope the video has made some sense to you. I tried to make them as simple as I possibly could because some of the mechanics are really complicated and quite tricky to grasp. So I hope this all kind of worked for you. I will do another series of tutorial videos for Imperator Rome, helping explain the other aspects of the game, maybe army compositions, money-making, trade, and so forth. But uh, in the meantime, if this video was helpful, please don't hesitate to give it a like and subscribe, and I will also see you guys later. Bye for now.